In this passage, Jesus deals with the desperation of incurable disease and death. See, disease and incurable issues in life can cause despair, grief, and fear. It can lead to depression and hopelessness. And this is an area that Jesus responds to. He cares about the loss of dignity. He wants to give spiritual guidance and hope. When a child is found to have an incurable disease, nothing can bring the parents to their knees faster than that. And when the condition lingers and there's no hope or no cure yet found, the condition and the pressure grows in the hearts and minds of the parents. They feel helpless and desperate and it drives them to consider almost anything We forget our pride and our dignity when we're searching for an answer in the midst of hopelessness. We spend any amount of money necessary to travel, to go any distance, to talk to anybody in hope of getting a cure. Our desperation can know no bounds. For humanity, the fear of death is a universal reality. It's not just Christians and Jews. Everyone on the planet fears death. It's like a deadly virus. See, sin has had a devastating effect on every human being tells us that in Romans, but we see it in everyday life. Its corrupting influence is pervasive and destructive. It careens people into sickness and suffering and ultimately to death. It was Adam's disobedience in the garden that first introduced death into the world and his descendants have all inherited this terminal condition. No matter what continent you live on or what time period you have lived, this is a universal reality. It raises critical questions. Has anyone ever conquered death? The Bible answers this question with a resounding yes. There is a deliverer. His name is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. John eleven twenty five, and following. See, Jesus isn't worried about impurity. He's not worried about getting his hands dirty. He is not worried about being defiled. He touches a leper and cleanses him. He ventures into a tomb and drives out a legion of demons out of a man into a herd of pigs. 
There's a woman with a hemorrhage. And being in her presence is unclean. But it makes no difference to Jesus. He touches a dead girl and brings her to life. See, Jesus doesn't need to purify himself from the pollution of a person. Whether, whatever kind of uncleanliness it is, he overcomes it. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Jesus has an amazing authority over death, over impurity, and over sickness. Jesus' compassion for the sick causes him to ignore the purity laws and bring purity and healing to suffering people wherever they may be. Whether they're Jew or Gentile, And he reverses the status of this unnamed woman who is unclean, and she becomes a model of faith. See, faith is not a necessity for healing, but it allows a person to participate in the process. Compassion has priority over regulations in the ministry to needy people. Death for the believer is not an end. It is only a beginning. You see, we can come to Jesus with our requests and he will even honor imperfect faith when the object of that faith is in him. Verse 21 of chapter 5. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed in around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she fell in her body, felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched you? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. 
Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why well, bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader. Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. See, Jesus had been a fixture in this harbor town, Capernaum, on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. He went there often, and he taught in the synagogue there regularly. Jesus had crossed the Sea of Galilee, and he was back home, and this great crowd gathered. See, Jesus had dealt with four types of miracles. <clears throat> First, there was the power over nature, over demons, and now we're looking at over sickness and over death. Sickness and death are similar to the exorcism story and that both deal with matters of purity law. See, Jesus' compassion for the people hurting was a priority over legal codes. He didn't wash his hands. He didn't ceremony cleanse himself. Both of the stories in this passage deal with uncleanliness. The uncleanliness of death, the uncleanliness of the issue of blood. Both had the name, the number 12 in them. The girl was 12 years old and the lady with the hemorrhage had had it for 12 years. One of the synagogue leaders fell at his feet, Jairus, which means he awakens or he sees. Very fitting name for him because he came to see in the course of this passage that Jesus had power. He was, Jesus was on a mission. And this father, Jairus, was also on a mission. And nothing could stop this father's love. He had observed the Lord's healing of others in the community over the weeks and months previously. And that's when he 
became desperate because his daughter was getting sicker and sicker and there was no cure. And he made this short journey to see if he could get this teacher to come to his home. This particular synagogue leader, which was a civic leader, he didn't think theologically correct about Jesus. He wasn't involved in the politics between the Pharisees and Jesus or the Sadducees and Jesus. His daughter was what his heart and mind was focused on. She was dying and had no hope of survival without the healing power of Jesus. He was one of the rulers of the synagogue. Each small synagogue had one, uh, seven community leaders in an average town. And this particular guy was the number one out of seven. He was, they're usually wealthy patrons who give in charge over the, the physical building and its finances. And they're involved in the order of worship, the choice of who would read scripture and give a homily or a sermon. This man fell at Jesus' feet it shows his desperation and his regard for Jesus. My little daughter is dying. He's at the end of his rope and is praying that Jesus can heal of this terrible disease. See, Jesus had touched a leper and healed him. Everybody was talking about that. And he's hoping that Jesus can touch his daughter and heal her. And Jesus is moving toward the house of Jairus and a woman subject to bleeding in this large crowd, this jostling crowd, pushing and shoving, trying to get in these, in these narrow streets to a location. And see, this woman had been monthly unclean for 12 years. Her whole life has been unclean. She had lost all her possessions searching for a cure. She was a pariah. She was a virtual leper everyone around her. Nobody could get close to her because of the imp impurity laws. The horror that this woman lived with for 12 years. And she thought to herself, if I just touch his clothes. See, doctors were powerless. They didn't know what to do. They had tried everything. They'd taken her money, but to no avail. And this bleeding caused her to be in a constant condition of ritual uncleanliness. And her, her faith was great. Just to touch by Jesus. She had faith that touching his garment, even without him knowing about it, would be enough to heal her. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. 
this is a word that he uses in this passage over and over again, immediately. For 12 years, she's had this condition and she touches him and immediately she knows, she senses in her body that she is clean. She is healed. And she feels free from such suffering. There had to be some instantaneous physical sensation of wellness that lifted this terrible burden up from her. The effect of Jesus was powerful. And she is asked to make herself known. And she's trembling with fear. The disciples were shocked. Jesus, how did you know? How could you possibly sense that somebody intentionally tried to touch you? If you've ever been in an airport or on a subway and in some crowded, busy city, there's no idea for the, the common human. But Jesus was aware. Further proof of Jesus' supernatural power. Jesus could be displeased that he made, was made unclean. None of that mattered to Jesus. Jesus simply says, your faith has healed you. While Jesus was still speaking, some people from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Just believe. J Jairus is devastated by this terrible news. While he was asking Jesus for help, his daughter has died, and it appears hopeless. See, everyone assumes that it's too late. Don't bother the teacher anymore. They need mourners now. It's too late for healers. Yet Jesus ignored the unbelief of those around him and said, don't be afraid. So when you feel hopeless and afraid, when others claim that nothing can be done, remember that Jesus is the source of all hope and all promise. Don't get caught in a trap of unbelief. Keep trusting, keep hoping, never give up. As David Garland says, Jairus must realize that faith is something that trusts in the midst of hopelessness. When you have trust, when you have faith, nothing is ever hopeless. And Jesus didn't let him anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John. And he's telling the people that are there, the child is not dead, but asleep. See, in the Near Eastern cultures, once someone died, there would be a people, group of people who were looking for a job. When they hear that somebody is sick and dying, they show up. Because you paid people to be a mourner and to weep and to wail for the dead. Jesus heard the commotion 
and effectively fired the mourners. Your services aren't needed. Go home. There's no place for weeping and wailing where no one has died. See, they knew what the smell of death was. They could look and sense death. But Jesus assured them, the child has not died, but is asleep. Our creator did not make us in his own image to have us endure diseases, fall victim to disasters, suffer death, and then rot in the ground. He created us to live in dignity, to rule with our Savior and our Lord as vice regents over the rest of creation, to enjoy life beyond the grave, and to share intimate joy with him. See, people in that day knew what death was. That's why they laughed. It was crazy. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. Immediately. There was no passage of time. There wasn't two minutes, one minute, 10 minutes. It was immediate. And they were astounded. They were losing their wits. They were going out of their minds. They had never seen anything like this. This miracle is instantaneous. And he gives them strict orders not to tell anyone about this. Jesus took the young girl's lifeless hand. It would have been ritually unclean. He didn't care. See, the true meaning behind this miracle is that it is the resurrection that she has to look forward to now. See, he's not just a wonder worker and a future king. He is someone who can raise the dead. Physical healing is a harbinger a future resurrection. We must rely on his loving presence in our lives. He transforms situations. The fishermen are no longer fishing at their nets. Sick people are restored to health. Critics are confounded. A storm is stilled. Hunger is assuaged. A dead girl is walking. An incurable disease is healed. It is by faith. Faith allows us to participate with God. Our faith doesn't tell God what to do. He is sovereign. He makes the choices. He has the right to say no. 
nor does the degree of our faith influence God's healing power. It's his decision. God remains sovereign. He heals who he wants. See, being female, impure, dishonored, destitute, are no barriers for receiving help. Not with Jesus. God always takes the side of those who have been denied rights and privileges, who've been oppressed and who are poor. See, God's, in God's kingdom, there are no nobodies. Everybody is a somebody. Faith enables all honored and dishonored, clean and unclean, to tap into the merciful power of Jesus Christ that brings healing and salvation. All are equals in Christ. Faith is a, an amazing concept. The rabbinic tradition concerning the story of Exodus is mind-blowing. To them, only after the Israelites had gone into the sea up to their nostrils did the waters divide and expose dry ground. You know, we, we, we've seen the Prince of Egypt, we've seen Charleston Heston, he touches the rod and the sea parts and then they walk. But the rabbinic tradition doesn't see it that way. They see it that only after the Israelites began to walk into the sea and when it got to the level of their nostrils, did the waters divide and expose ground that was dry. Whether this happened or not, it interprets actually, accurately, and captures what faith is all about. Faith doesn't wait to see if the waters will divide and then step out. It steps out trusting God to do what is needed. Where do you need to step out in your life? On faith. Expecting God to hear. Or the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They expressed the kind of faith that carries us through any and all tragedy when we are faced with people who might want to torment us. They said in Daniel 3, 17 and 18, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. See, faith opens the door to God's power. Faith transfers divine power to those who were utterly powerless. It's your faith has healed you, it says. Faith can be imperfect, it can be bold, it can be halting, it can be brave, it can be laced with fear and trepidation. Faith shows persistence in overcoming an obstacle. The woman works her way through the crowd and overcomes any sense of shame she might have to fear. Faith goes forward in the face of mocking laughter and refuses to give in to fear and scorn. 
It's defiant. Faith is embodied in action. Faith is something that can be seen, like a man digging through a roof to bring their friend to Jesus. It kneels, it begs, it reaches out to touch. Belief about Jesus does not bring healing, but faith in Jesus that takes action does. See, it's not right theology. Right theology is not a condition of the faith in the story. Neither the man nor the woman identify Jesus as the Messiah or even as a prophet. Jairus doesn't say, oh, this is the Messiah, not because I believe in that, that's why my daughter is going to get healed. No, the woman doesn't identify Jesus as the Messiah. She has faith. Because of God acting because of their faith, I expect to see Jairus in eternity. And I expect to see this woman, if we can even make out who she is. Love is part of what Jesus is driven by. It prioritizes compassion. All things are made clean by the presence and love of Jesus. His concern overrides all difficult conditions. But the most glorious of the points of this passage is that death is not the end. The rising of the little girl is a harbinger of Jesus' resurrection and therefore of the future resurrection of all of us whom Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 and 23. Her death was temporary as Jesus raised her once more to life. Our death will be far more temporary for it will be immediately it will be transformed into a life that will be everlasting. People don't recover from death. The only thing in the universe more final than death is the word of God saying, arise. See, Jesus redefined death by calling it sleep. Lifeless, a lifeless body will rise again. There's hope in heaven. There is a reunion awaiting us all if we are in Christ. Trust the promise and tell everyone about it. He calls it sleep because he wills, in this particular case, to make death as impermanent as sleeping by raising the girl to life. Jesus' power is part of the kingdom of God, which is present and will and not be fully manifested until he returns. Our faith is in God's power to conquer death, not simply to restore things as they were. Knowing that God has conquered death in the resurrection of Christ. Timothy George wrote a book on the theology of the Reformers and recalls one of the lowest points in Martin Luther's life. Martin Luther was a monk who studied the scriptures and found out that, that it was by faith that you are saved by Christ. He married a nun. A woman who was Catherine was a nun and they had a family. 
But when his daughter Magdalena was only 14 years old, she was stricken by the plague, the Black Death that was going through Europe. Brokenhearted, he knelt beside her bed and begged God to release her from the pain. See, it was a painful death. When she had died and the carpenters were nailing down the lid of her coffin, Luther cried out, hammer away. On doomsday, she will rise again. See, death is not the end when you put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ. There is life beyond the grave. Why do we believe that? Because Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. And it's that hope that we commit our lives to, it is foundational to the Christian faith, whether you're Protestant or Catholic. It is by faith that you find God. It is by faith that you have the hope that you too will be raised as Christ was raised. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this hope. Lord, there's so many people that are dealing with incurable disease, struggling with death. We pray, Lord, that you would give their hearts and minds peace and rest. May they have faith in you because you died for our sins. You were buried and you rose again. And as we put our faith and hope in you and as we walk with you through the difficulties of this life, we put our faith and trust in you for all eternity, not just here in this life, but in the life for eternal the, the eternal dimension of heaven. In Christ's name we pray, amen.